colleagues. Um, we expect maybe a few more to join. Good day to you all and welcome to the online talk show to commemorate the 2020 World Press Freedom Day this year. Due to the crisis, all World Press Freedom Day events around the world are being held online. The global theme for this year is journalism without fear or favor. And the local theme for this event is reporting in the times of COVID-19. The, the talk show will be recorded for release on the 3rd of May. Kindly note, we may not all appear on the screen depending on the devices we are using. Also, we are all initially put on mute. To talk, please go to reactions on the status bar and raise your hand. To switch on and off the microphone, you also go to the status bar or press, or, or, uh, press space bar. My name is Ezekiel Lamini, Communication and Information Advisor at the UNESCO New Delhi office. Allow me to introduce the personality in attendance today. We have Mr. Eric Falt, Director of the UNESCO New Delhi office, joining us from France. Thank you, Eric. We have our host, our talk show host today, Mr. Pachas, excuse me, Mr. Pankaj Pachori, founder and editor in chief, Go News in India. Sorry, sir. Please raise your hand so people can see. Thank you very much. We have speakers from our, our South Asia countries. We have Ms. Namkei Zam, Executive Director of the Journalist Association of Bhutan. Please raise your hand, ma'am. Thank you. We have Ms. Mina Fayaz Rashad, Chairman of One Media Group and President Uh, yes, thank you very much, ma'am. And we have <laughs> we have Professor Madhu Paha, director of SEMCA in India. And um, I think that is is there anybody else I have forgotten among the yes, I, I have. Um, Mr. Rajiv Chandran, uh, unique UN Information Center in India. Um, I think the screen is not on, but uh, he may be with us, or I don't know if I've forgotten somebody else, but the others, um, the majority of the others are my colleagues from the UNESCO New Delhi office. They are supporting this event in various ways. At this juncture, I would like to invite Mr. Eric Falt, director of the UNESCO office in New Delhi to give his opening remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Ezekiel, and uh, dear friends, it's a pleasure to welcome all of you in this uh, rather unusual uh, gathering. Uh, we are here to celebrate together World Press Freedom Day, which, uh, as you know, was proclaimed by the UN General Assembly back in 1993. So this is a day to commemorate the essence of the media. It is a day to uh, honor the, the fundamental principles of press freedom to uh, evaluate press freedom around the world and to defend the media from uh, attacks on their independence, as clearly our theme this year uh, suggests. Uh, I hope that uh, this uh, talk show will be seen beyond uh, the recording today by many others uh, whenever, when we uh, air it. We at UNESCO lead the global celebration of World Press Freedom Day on uh, May the 3rd every year. We, we believe that a, a free press allows for mutual understanding to build a sustainable peace because it is at the core of our mandate to uh, 
celebrate press, freedom of the press and, and freedom of expression every time. And I have to say, unfortunately, uh, the 3rd of May is also an opportunity to, to pay tribute to uh, the journalists who have lost their lives. Uh, many others have also faced a, a number of challenges in their line of duty. I think the past year has been particularly heavy and uh, difficult for all the journalists who are in the field every day. Uh, and uh, obviously, the times are being more made more difficult by the COVID pandemic, which makes it uh, more difficult to gather information for uh, journalists. So. The global theme for this year, which was decided a, a number of months ago before we all knew uh, the circumstances that we would, uh, in which we will find ourselves today, is journalism without fear or favor. It is about journalists reporting professionally from uh, the front lines, and this year the front line also extends to the global health crisis of COVID-19, and doing so without fear or favor, because yes, this is what... Uh, represents the best of the press. And a free and an independent press is essential at all times. This is something that we solemnly at UNESCO want to recognize together with all of our UN partners. And it's even more important during a, a health crisis such as the one that we're currently uh, experiencing. I think uh, uh, many seek uh, information primarily online during these times and uh, the role of professional journalists continues to be uh, vital. I think also crisis situations like these amplify the role of the media in keeping uh, societies uh, together. Uh, the media are the primary source of uh, information in, a no in normal times and even more so uh, in the, the, the times that we're living. And despite stringent measures of social uh, distancing that have been put in place all across the world, uh, news organizations still have to run uh, from pillar to post in order to provide information. The question is, are they prepared to do so? And we have seen all over the world, the newsroom of uh, large media houses getting hit uh, by the coronavirus. We've seen media organizations in India and in the region uh, grappling with uh, the lack of proper security measures or compelled to send uh, reporters sometimes out in the field without proper security gear, all in the quest of stories from the ground on unhindered information. One of the questions that I'm sure we will ask ourselves today is, uh, what exactly is essential information during a pandemic? Is the role of the media going to take a different uh, shape in the weeks to come? Most importantly, what about the safety of journalists covering a health crisis? Because unlike what we can see during a war, a disaster, COVID-19 quite clearly has blurred the definition of what represents a front line. I'm asking these questions, but I don't have uh, answers. So uh, it is important to gather all of you, uh, experienced uh, guests and speakers, to, to talk about uh, what it means to report in the times of COVID-19, to uh, exchange. There are very few opportunities to, to do so. And I'm glad that uh, uh, together with our team, we've been able to assemble media experts from uh, uh, the region, from uh, India, where UNESCO New Delhi is based, of course, but also from Sri Lanka, Bhutan, and the Maldives. And I want to pay tribute to all of you uh, working in different uh, capacities. I know that uh, uh, all over the region, we have remarkable journalists traveling to uh, narrate stories uh, uh, from the heart of the, the pandemic. I, uh, I don't want to be too long, but I want to mention also very briefly that... Uh, uh, beyond the celebration of World Press Freedom Day, uh, UNESCO will uh, report specifically this year on uh, the safety of journalists and the issue of impunity, as we do every year. Uh, this is a report that will be launched later this year, and uh, which will highlight the uh, issue of uh, uh, protection of journalists, uh, more specifically during this uh, pandemic. And we all must uh, look at the Sustainable Development Goals, and more specifically Target 16.10, uh, which asks us to ensure public access to information and to protect, protect fundamental freedoms. The 3rd of May and World Press Freedom Day is a time where we can uh, come together and celebrate the courage of uh, journalists who are risking their lives in pursuit of facts and information, because clearly more than ever we need facts. More than ever we need press freedom. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Fault.
for those insightful remarks. May I now hand over to our talk show host, Mr. Pankaj Bachori, to take us forward. Thank you. Uh, please, Mr. Pachori, can you please switch on your, your mic? Thank you. Thank you, Zaykal. Thank you, UNICEF. Thank you, Mr. Paul. And thank you, all of you who found time to join this. Uh, journalism, as we say, is a, is a business of facts. And at these times of uh, COVID pandemic, facts, are become, facts have become very important. And the role of the media has become very important. As a part of the SDGs and as part of the freedom of expression or public access to knowledge, it's uh, very important that uh, these kind of uh, platforms are used to discuss and to disseminate what role media can play in these times. As it is, media has been under a lot of scrutiny. We've been seeing that. And in India, especially where I report from, the Press Freedom Index. On Press Freedom Index, India is uh, doing worse every year. And there have been already a lot of pressures on the media and on World Press Freedom Day. We have to remember that, catalog that, discuss that, and find ways out. Thank you all for joining me. In India, during uh, the reporting on uh, COVID pandemic, 53 journalists in Bombay have been found positive on this. As the pandemic increases, media people have become the first responders. And the first responders are at risk, including reporters, including doctors, nurses, and uh, health uh, professionals. So that's one thing we'd like to talk about, that how in your countries, media is reporting on this crisis and what problems, as Eric said earlier, they are facing in uh, reporting it. I can uh, give my example that I work in a place called Noida, which has about uh, 200 media houses in just one small district. And the government decided to lock down that area. And you can imagine that more than 100,000 people applied for curfew passes, and only 10,000 were given. And in today's day and age, we can work from home, but it's very difficult for people working in television to work from home. And so those are the kind, and now the government has stopped giving more curfew passes to people. So the information, the free flow of information about the COVID uh, pandemic, among other things, is being restrained in a way by the governments because the government's job has become very big. So I'll, I'll, I'll uh, first start with the, my fellow panelists of what the situation is in their uh, areas, because besides being a health pandemic, this is also for the uh, countries of uh, South Asia, who are uh, fortunately uh, not hit as much as Europe and the United States and China in terms of uh, the health crisis, but the economic crisis is going to hit all of us sooner or later. So I'll start with Udita Jaisinghe uh, uh, from Sri Lanka. Udita, what is the situation in Sri Lanka? What kind of difficulties media personnel are feeling right now in covering this crisis? And uh, uh, what do you see in the future once uh, the lockdowns are uh, um, ended and uh, the economic impact is going to be felt by the country. Odita. Uh, thank you and thank you UNESCO for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, uh, in, in terms of Sri Lanka, when you look at uh, patient numbers, I think we're still pretty okay. We are around the 660 mark or so. Uh, the number of, there have been over 100 people who have recovered. Uh, the number of deaths is relatively low. It's only been seven in terms of official records. Of course, this is a very disputed number. Um, but as 
journalists, I think there are several issues that we have come across, as you uh, mentioned, the lack of uh, protection, protective gear, uh, support from our companies that do not understand the kind of challenges that we need. Um, and of course, you know, financially speaking, all industries have been hit, including media, right? So we are all facing, I mean, for example, a few weeks ago, my company, which uses a lot of um, freelancers and contract employees, said that across the board, 50% of salaries are going to be cut, just like that, for all the freelancers, for all the contract workers. And that is a huge problem because we have reporters, editors, sub-editors, photographers, graphic designers, layout staff, who all function as contract employees or freelancers. So virtually, we will have no staff, uh, you know, if, if these uh, pay cuts actually go through. So for me, really, one of the biggest challenges is that. Uh, and of course, secondly, as an editor, I always hesitate when I think, oh, you know, we need this story, but then I'm sending this person to the front lines. They may get infected. They are given, uh, you know, very little support. There is no insurance, no hazard pay cover. These people are married. They have kids. How can I do this? And often, I very reluctantly drop the story rather than expect them to go in because uh, you know we've already had to quarantine some of our staff so that's a massive responsibility uh, thirdly I think uh, in Sri Lanka the media has been accused uh, of anti-minority sentiment of uh, spreading particularly anti-muslim sentiment by highlighting more about the infections of uh, the Muslim population than the rest of the communities and this in itself has been a very big problem uh, in Sri Lanka the fourth thing that I think is very problematic is we have this very interesting convergence where we were supposed to have parliamentary elections. Now, because of the COVID crisis, the parliamentary elections have been postponed once. It may be postponed further. And uh, we are heading towards a constitutional crisis. Essentially, our parliament has to meet before the 2nd of June, or we're heading into a full-blown constitutional crisis, and the president has so far refused to reconvene the old parliament. So that is going to make life very difficult for us. Also because, as you know, without a parliament, there can be no budget. Allocation of resources for critical essential services will be affected. Uh, Sri Lanka is a country that faces high levels of debt. We have to repay some three $3.2 billion from May to December. And the government has to go out. They have to raise funds for this debt repayment. There may not be a legal standing for the government to do this unless there are parliament elections and uh, you know the, the, the constitutional process is followed diligently. So we have that issue. Uh, so I think that political question is going to become more serious in the coming weeks. Uh, and of course, last of all, but perhaps the most important is, you know, the response to COVID. Uh, and we are not given access to ask the tough questions. I think this is an issue across all our countries where, you know, top officials who make up the task forces, we have task forces for everything now. It's, it's very militaristic. Uh, and we are not given, you know, we're not given, I, I can see Kumar Lok is laughing along <laughs> as I'm saying this. And it, it's very true, you know, even the health officials are being overruled by the military, the military run the task forces. Uh, and more, most tragically, even the military is finding it difficult to cope. I mean, uh, our re most recent cluster is from a Navy camp uh, and over 200 people uh, have been and their families have tested positive for COVID. So, you know, this, this, this is a really, really big problem. And so, you know, we are inundated with press statements, but it's all what the government wants the public. Thank you. Thank, so, yeah. you. thank, thank you, Odita. And you've uh, touched upon many um, uh, points there which are exercising the minds of the people within the media and one uh, point is and a very crucial point is that because of the uh, COVID pandemic uh, governments across the world have uh, uh, become bigger because people are looking at the governments they have got more powers and where they didn't have powers they have usurped powers I mean federalism is at retreat right now everywhere in the world uh, globalization is at retreat at everywhere in the world and in this kind of a situation i'll uh, uh, go to uh, venu arora here and ask her that do you think that there is a serious crisis before the media before free press because the governments are becoming bigger and they would like to dictate the terms to media much more than before 
I I agree, Mr. Pachari. I I completely agree with you that that is currently the situation. But uh, my work is in the field of community radio and community media, and we are working over the last two three years uh, with media literacy. And I see a, a ray of hope there, because uh, I think the what the pandemic has done has brought many of the underlying situations that we all knew. Uh, exists you know we knew that the media was relying on uh, advertising and that was not necessarily the best way to be uh, so i think in many ways in terms of freedom of expression and the freedom of press uh, the pandemic is uh, asking us to think out of the box and rethink the role the media needs to play so i agree that it is a point where the government has become big but i think what we are also seeing is where we have managed to do the media literacy and the reporting that i am seeing from my community radio reporters they are on the ground so exactly what you said in the beginning reporters are unable to go on the ground but the community reporters that i'm working with are already on the ground and because we worked with them over the last 2 years on media literacy on reporting skills on understanding facts reporting factually a lot of the information that we are able to gather and put out at post uh, as podcasts uh, you know informing the larger so called digitally connected community about what is happening on the ground with migrants who are stuck in slums etc so of course this is just a slice you know it is it is a very small component of the larger work and i uh, you know i don't know whether that's the way out but i think definitely mm, what what the pandemic has done has uh, put out those key bullet points that we need to really address in the long term uh, whether it is with governments becoming bigger and therefore putting a crunch on the kind of information uh, and accountability that they need to uh, have towards the citizens yes uh, thank you uh, i'll take this question now to uh, bhutan to nange zam uh, who is the executive director of journalists association in in bhutan uh, what is the situation there uh, and uh, and do you think that uh, media freedom in the garb of information management is being hurt in terms of uh, uh, covid uh, uh, crisis um thank you mr pachauri um so i think compared to the rest of the region as well as many parts of the world bhutan has been faring very well uh we have not had to enter lockdown so far so we've just been advised uh to work from home many media houses have a safety protocol in place already as well uh so not many challenges our salaries are not getting cut journalists haven't lost their jobs yet so fingers crossed uh we have some freelancers but many work for international media so um i think they do have side jobs side hustles <laughs> that will see them through for now um uh, but uh the part that i want to really address is the second part of your question about information management and um, we saw a little bit of a hiccup initially um i think the fear was everybody would panic and we would have a crisis situation in bhutan and uh, the government was really worried about information load misinformation and fake news um so what they did was it was it was from a place of good intention but i think it really hurt us initially because they came out and they said that the government particularly the health ministry would be the only source of credible information on covid-19 um so that made the rest of us look like jokers uh, why should anybody um listen to journalists or why should people read anything that we put out or produce anything that we put out um so when i put this out as the executive director of the journalists association of bhutan we were called uh we had an immediate meeting with the prime minister and he clarified and he said we all have to work together and it isn't as if we're trying to hold information and frankly our government has been extremely transparent we've had a really good flow of information in fact we have a press conference with the health ministry tomorrow when we had the first confirmed case in bhutan which was not even a bhutanese um it was an imported case an american tourist the index case um we had press conferences every single day 
after a while, I think journalists were running out of questions to ask as well, and it seemed a little redundant. Um, so now they've timed it for at least twice a week or at least uh, once a week, um, depending on uh, what the situation is. So far, we've only had seven confirmed cases, of which uh, five have recovered already. Two, all of the cases were in quarantine. We've had zero community transmission in the last two months, ever since the first case was detected. So for journalists, it's been quite easy. I think we've been, uh, we are the lucky lot right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, uh, and all the best for the rest of the uh, uh, time of the pandemic, because uh, Thank you. It was, the situation in the countries is not this thing. Uh, you uh, mentioned a point about uh, uh, the social media and uh, fake news and all that. I'll take the uh, question to Maldives, uh, to Minakas, Rashid, Rashad, uh, because Maldives is, uh, it's a small country, not many people know that Ma Maldives is one of the uh, 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 countries that uses the social media very creatively, very innovatively, and at a very large scale. So what has been the impact there on free flow of information from the rest of the world and from within the country? Uh, thank you so much for inviting me for this discussion. Um, as you said, uh, here social media, I mean, we basically uh, live in social media in a, a pandemic like this where we are currently in a lockdown. Uh, so most of us, while we are staying at home, we are always tweeting or Facebooking or Instagramming, and uh, it it was a it has been a, a difficult time for us to sustain uh, and also hold on to true information and to uh, verify and reconfirm informations. But uh, luckily, uh, our community spread just started recently on fifteenth uh, of April, where uh, uh, the first case was identified in Mali City. Uh, but our first case, which was uh, initially identified was in 7th May, which was in one of the resorts. So because we are an island nation, uh, uh, the authorities actually uh, thought that it would be easy to uh, uh, sustain and contain the cases. But then unfortunately, we did have a community spread, which was uh, initially being there for about two weeks. And uh, as far as the current new information are there, it might be here since February itself. But uh, uh, to in order to uh, address the social media videos and social media posts, uh, we, uh, the government had actually appointed a spokesperson for the COVID-19. Uh, since uh, March, we used to have a spokesperson. Uh, we have almost every day or like twice a day, we have press conferences where they actually address all of our, all the media journals they meet and then they discuss on all the issues and the current updates and they actually give the figures. Uh, the, we also have a, a Official Viber, uh, like Health Protection Authority, has an official Viber group where they give the proper information. They has a they have a verified Twitter account where they keep tweeting the real information as well. So uh, it was it uh, for journalists. It is very easy to verify news here because it's very easy to access our spokesperson and he uh, uh, he does answer his calls and uh, respond to us. But uh, but uh, to answer some of the other queries, uh, we most of this uh, uh, media, uh, uh, since we are a very small country uh, and we depend on uh, tourism, and because our borders are sh being shut down right now, uh, we are highly affected uh, in our economy side. So that has a, a direct impact on the media because media generally rely on our sponsors and partners. And as the companies, I mean, when the companies, countries on lockdown as they close down the companies uh, uh, they, the first thing they cut down is the PR and marketing budget and that is affecting all the media so I mean most of the media have uh, so much termination notices and some of the uh, medias have even asked for public for their help as well to sustain the journalists and sustain the media as well and uh, unfortunately not much uh, of uh, importance has been given to uh, to the journalist or to the media but what people didn't realize was that even though you can give relief packages for the companies or relief packages to the business owners uh, it is the media even though our office is closed we still have to work from home and we are doing a 24 7 job here and uh, also, the uh, 
mental health issues of the journalist, uh, the psychosocial aspect was uh, has been uh, something that has been neglected and ignored even, and especially for journalists. Uh, it was just last week on Wednesday, uh, we had uh, uh, some of the doctors who was talking about the psychosocial issues and they, they were advising the journalists and medias, not just for the journalists, point of view, but even for the community point of view, to not keep on giving marathon COVID-19 uh, information because the people watching the TV or getting the informations are always, uh, I mean, they are always on COVID news. And also for the journalists, for them to take care of themselves and just free themselves. But right now, uh, because we just started our community spread and it's just going for the peak, uh, uh, like for example, even uh, last night we just had our first uh, death, and then every all the journalists, all of us are still awake, we are still uh, operating. So this is this is also affecting our production level, and it's affecting uh, our personal life as well. So and uh, also the I wanted to address the, regarding the peep, uh, the uh, workers, the journalists uh, who are actually in the field work, uh, they don't really have the PPEs. They they need. I mean, we also we consider the health workers, we consider the frontliners, but we don't involve the journalists in the frontliners. We don't take journalists as the frontliners. And uh, but even though some our state media and some of the TV stations have they, they locked on themselves in the station, and all the online media are working straight from home, we still have field journalists like photographers and videographers working in the field. So uh, we need to consider and uh, to give them relevant PPEs so that their safety is also. Uh, being considered in this. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, you, you raised the question of, uh, of you know, uh, 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 reporters working with the government in tandem. And uh, uh, mostly, I think all governments have uh, now found a way of dealing with uh, uh, this problem. So there's no gap as, 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 for, as, as far as the uh, pandemic is concerned. But there are other issues which uh, raised and which should be raised here uh, that that's about criticism of the government so that's one big thing that now with this pandemic uh, criticism of the government itself as be, is being seen as something which is an anti-national uh, attribute and which is not good because the governments even if they are fighting such a pandemic uh, journalist role is to point out if there are any mistakes and uh, support the government in terms of uh, disseminating right information to people because that's the only way we can fight it. Uh, Chinki Sina, uh, uh, do you find your uh, output uh, being uh, affected by this uh, extra carefulness about balancing these two things? Your responsibility as a uh, media organization and uh, uh, your uh, inner instinct to find faults in what is wrong, which is occurring right now. Uh, yes, uh, it's difficult to report because there is this uh, clause of balancing both the sides. Now, even if you get one side, it's very difficult to get the government to comment. So, for instance, I was working on a story on uh, doctors not being able to get uh, protective care at uh, AIMS and there was a diversion of funds, which was about 50 lakhs, which the BDL group had given AIMS to procure PPE kits, which was then diverted. And all of this was out on Twitter. Uh, we got all the information, but uh, the clause is to balance the uh, the news with uh, with a quote from the health ministry and we kept writing to the health ministry to the aims director nobody responded so that story eventually could not be run because of a simple uh, matter of a quote to balance quote unquote the story where whereas we had all the facts now this is happening in, at every step um, for journalists over here because for every story that you do you have to get a uh, you know, like the other side and the other side is not very easy to get. Like I just went to uh, UP on a field trip and uh, we wanted, you know, the doctors have been warned against speaking to media in India, especially and not to show the negative side. And we have ample reports of it. Uh, AIMS RDA has talked about it and several other doctors. Uh, we can't quote people without taking their names because then it becomes a problem. So we went to this uh, uh, community health uh, center and the doctor refused to speak to us. We had fixed up all the appointments in advance. All of it collapsed. And uh, so it's becoming increasingly difficult to uh, sort of function in this kind of a 
of an environment plus you listen to all the news of journalists getting arrested uh, journalists getting picked up uh, there's massive trolling like i was reporting on the northeast delhi riots which obviously has taken a back seat now because of this pandemic situation so other stories are also suffering uh so what happened was that uh, you know on twitter if you post a story uh, you are instantly called anti national although the story has uh, nothing to do with any of those thing is just factual reporting so i think we are at a stage where uh, we have television which is always uh, trying to give more analysis opinion everything and there are uh, ground reporters who are well digital or print who are trying to get the facts so the pandemic what it's what it's uh, trying to sort of teach us or i would say journalist also is the thing that we should focus on facts i think facts are more important than dramatizing the whole situation which the tv is doing and because of the television because of people who are trying to uh, do this kind of uh, strange reporting uh, we are facing a lot of issues on the ground like you know we have been uh, we have come close to being attacked um, myself i have i have you know faced this kind of situation we have uh, people don't want to talk to us people think we are agents of some some person or the other so it's becoming increasingly difficult to report in a situation like this which i hope uh, gets better and the government realizes that a free flow of information and proper information is important and start speaking to the media because right now they also have restricted information in terms of the the data that is being released so if we get any data there's no way how uh, how do we get to verify mm -hmm. so these are the things plus mental stress i would say is a lot more mm -hmm. uh, because of all this pressure that is building on us yes. so yeah so that media media people especially as i said they are the first responders they need counseling in uh, delhi after the bombay mm -hmm. incident in pune incident where a lot of uh, reporters were found to be positive with covid 19 uh, they were given a uh, free and special access to uh, uh, testing and luckily in delhi more than 200 journalists were tested and none of them were found uh, to be uh, covid positive so they were reporting from uh, those hot zones and uh, uh, on the ground from hospitals and all uh, you raised the issue also about uh, uh, the government and uh, uh, advertising someone raised that issue about advertising and all Uh, I can come now to the uh, Kumar Lopez and ask him that financially, uh, do you think uh, the uh, crisis is going to disable and disrupt a lot of media industry? Uh, because, as in India, if you look at uh, most of the uh, television centers in India, they make uh, money by two. Uh, ways number one is advertising and number two organizing big events all the events have been uh, cancelled and no one knows when big conferences big summits and big events are going to take place I and mean, they can be done they're doing it right now here but these are not uh, financially viable uh, commodities for for media so do you think think that in the future there's going to be uh, a, a real recession Besides the economy, the recession is going to show much more on media, which is dependent on public and public events. Uh, your 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 mic is uh, muted. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Minasco, for giving me the opportunity and. Also, Mr. Panchari, uh, I think that's that's a question that's been asked. I think in all the industries. I think I've been uh, I've been participating in some of these other webinars in different industries, starting from the technological aspect to the industries and so on. And what we hear is like, how are we going to come out of it? I mean, there are so many things being said about like think out of the box, we can do it differently, etc., and so on. And uh, we all also see that there is a silver lining in this dark cloud as well right uh, let me also give you something encouraging i mean there has been a, a, a quick survey that was done online by one of the uh, research companies here and it indicated that uh, uh, based on the 2300 respondent right 86% right go to the television to consume information and news and what is the trust level 
Out of the 86%, you have 82% trusting that uh, media. But if you take social media, it's 60% that goes to social media, but the trust is only 12%. And if I go on to radio, radio has a very good rate of 32% that people consume, and then 25% is the trust level of that media, right? So e-newspaper, 29% and 16% is the trust level. So you find that, I mean, like the trust level on these mediums are really high, which would basically tell us that, well, we do have an opportunity where people are seeking for ethical, authentic information, which means we can revive this. But it's not going to be easy just coming out of it because now we are basically looking at the new norm, right? The new normalcy, right? We, I mean, you, today you find uh, the the late adopters and the laggards who would, who would not adapt to new technologies are now basically adapting to new technologies. E newspapers, right? People are reading the e newspapers on their mobile phone when at one point in time, although the newspaper industry was expecting that. It is anyway having its natural uh, death, but now it is suddenly become like, well, where is the newspaper? But if you look at the counter, uh, what do you call, uh, counter options that it has, I mean, you find like how Singapore has revived its uh, uh, economy, right? The newspapers have gone online. They're using some good digital tools that they're able to analyze and see what are the stories that people are picking up. And based on that, they're able to adjust their lines of writing the stories, the newsroom stand, the editorial stand, and they're able to pick up online and plus revenue. So that would anyway become a credible platform for people to advertise. So which means, yes, we also see that definitely like you find there is a collusion that uh, in Sri Lanka I could talk about is where the media houses, the advertising agencies, uh, the printers, the packaging guys, all those guys are trying to come together and approach the government to see, okay, what type of, uh, uh, what do you call, leverages and uh, help that the government could give, right? And that could something could also, so the engagement with the government could also help. But I think the strategies have to change. The strategies have to change and say, like, rather than we feel we are lost, it should be almost saying that, look, we do have an opportunity because there is the trust level that people have in the media. The entire do, you, do you think, Kumar, that uh, the independence of media uh, may be affected in the long run um, uh, with the crisis, uh, with this crisis, with the financial crisis which is grappling us? Because it's the smaller uh, media companies which are more independent and which are not uh, uh, um, dependent on, uh, say, the government advertising or very large advertising. They are going to be affected more as we come out of this crisis. Uh, I think if you even if you sit and analyze now, you would find even some of these companies have compromised on the media independence, right? It is not to say like I mean there are companies, as you rightly said, uh, Mr. Pacheri, that uh, the smaller companies seem to be drawing their lines, being more ethical, etc., and so on. But whereas advertising revenues tend to drive uh, some of the newsrooms and these organizations to compromise on the need for ethical reporting. So definitely the revenue uh, will have an impact, but that not necessarily would have to compromise the lines of a free media, right? I think that is something that the... Uh, the uh, your mic is muted again for some reason. Okay. Oh, sorry. So you would find that I think it's the uh, the company stand, the editorial stand, and the journalist stand, right? I think it's it has a chain. It has a chain reaction from the journalist to the editorial to the editorial to the organizational uh, policy and their stand to say, look, the business aspect of advertising revenue is one aspect, but our reporting and communication is of the public interest. If the companies can keep that separate, right? And I think eventually we can get the corporates also to understand it. It's not going to be easy. Definitely it's not going to be walk in the park. Probably it can be walk in the Jurassic Park, but uh, definitely it's going to be challenging. But I think we can draw that line because we have seen organization drawing that line and still surviving, still having the revenues. Yeah, we are getting now questions from people uh, Shivani is uh, asking, 
uh, that as Ms. Fares from Maldives pointed out, there are psychological strains along with the physical threats. Uh, our question is for Chinki Sina, who has been on the field. What is the cost of reporting in these times? Chinki Sina? Uh, well, there's a lot of cost because the, you, know, you are stressed out because you know, people are losing jobs. So that's there's that anxiety because you don't know. And ever since I completed my journalism, I think journalism has been in a state of recession throughout. So now every day, ever since the start of the pandemic, you are uh, listening to this thing of people losing their jobs and, you know, uh, pay cuts have been announced very early on. So a lot of my friends have had to go through uh, massive pay cuts. Uh, so that is there. Plus the stress of, uh, you know, going somewhere and knowing fully well that you might just get infected. So even though you are getting a PPE suit, it's not the best quality PPE suit that you can get. So I picked up one from the black market. I wore a garbage bag inside and then I went to the graveyard and uh, uh, to see the COVID-19 where they are burying the patients. But that day they started uh, throwing stones at uh, reporters and photographers. So I met my colleagues, I mean, my ex-colleagues and the people that I know. And, you know, we are all doing some kind of innovation. Somebody is wearing a raincoat. Somebody is wearing like sunglasses and covering their heads with something. So it's a lot of occupational hazard because we don't, you don't know where this uh, infection is uh, going to hit you from. And, you know, this whole sanitizing ritual and you are human, right? You can forget. So I came back, I come back from reporting and I'm, really stressed out because I'm not able to sleep uh, about the fact that I don't know if I have a little bit of cold or a cough I'm thinking okay re, you know I'm I'm done now so there's a lot of that stress plus the whole output situation because you know you're not able to function you're barely able to survive a lockdown and a pandemic plus in the middle of all this you are collecting news so as a reporter you have to track news every morning and you are listening to news you're reading news you're getting depressed your parents are somewhere else um, you're looking at the migrant worker situation you're looking at hunger you're looking at all kinds of things and after a point it hits you you know you're not able to you don't know if you are crying you're looking at nurses crying over videos it's not we are also human beings and we are vulnerable people we're not that's a huge. Hey, reporters are strong. You're not that strong. You know, it 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 sort of it's difficult. So I don't know how long we are able to hold on to sanity, but it's it's a struggle. I see. No, don't, 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 don't lose your sanity. Number one. Number two. I was talking to some bankers, and I, I I asked them the question that during this time, all the companies are going to be devalued in terms of uh, takeovers, in in terms of mergers and acquisitions. And the bankers told me very clearly, do not go by your earlier standards. If you are doing 20 stories a week, 10 are enough because everyone knows these are not normal times. And in normal times, other things happen, like you innovate. Uh, I'd like to go to Namge and ask them that what is happening in Bhutan, which you think has been generated by this crisis, which the media people have been able to innovate into doing something absolutely fantastic, which is good for the future of the profession. Um, so I am one of the few multimedia journalists uh, in the country and have always personally and professionally been asking my colleagues uh, to have a stronger online presence. So I, one of the biggest advantages I've seen of this very that situation is how we've become real-time journalists. Uh, we are really capitalizing on the kind of platforms that exist. Initially, people would be focused so much because we're very print-heavy in Bhutan and uh, a lot of the media are concentrated in the capital as well. Uh, everybody would only think about what they're going to get out in their newspapers instead of trying to reach out to people immediately. So with COVID-19, not only did we have an onslaught of infodemics, we also had an onslaught of breaking news every other hour. Um, but then it's just made all of our journalists uh, become multimedia journalists, which personally and professionally for me is a big step in the right direction. So they've had to really um, step up to the times and then be like, oh, we need to. And, and it was in a way, it, uh, one um, situation that was a little bit funny was how we were competing with the health ministry to get out information. We were going to see who's going to get out the information faster at one point. Uh, Chinki Sina was talking about verification as well as Mina from Maldives. Although, um, 
all of our all of the people are easily accessible to journalists in Bhutan because it's such a small country and there's a very there's a mechanism in place for people to cross check information. So the information that gets out very often is absolutely correct. Um, it isn't based on speculation or conjecture. We haven't had a lot of conspiracies in the country uh, besides fake news. So the Journalist Association of Bhutan, as well as the Bhutan Media Foundation, two media CSOs, we've worked very closely together with journalists as well as the government to put out fact checks because we don't have independent fact checking organizations in the country. At one point, especially um, initially when the first outbreak of COVID-19 happened in Bhutan, there was a lot of panic and people were believing all kinds of information and then people are running away from quarantine centers or somebody died because of COVID-19. So all of this, uh, we would reach out to him and say, we've seen this and we were getting this information faster than health ministry would. Um, so then there was this creation of WhatsApp groups uh, with the prime minister's office as well as um, with health ministry. So there's uh, verification in real time as well. So I see that this uh, free flowing and fast flowing of information as being advantages. Something that came out out of this pandemic, it was, it's really made us more mobile and uh, report faster and do our work faster and more connected as well. That, that, that's great. I'll uh, ask the same question to Udita about Sri Lanka uh, that uh, uh, do you think that there have been innovations? I mean, you look at the online world, there have been thousands and hundreds of new apps have been launched. People are using new techniques. Fact checking companies and fact checking websites are being used in uh, the multiples and their were, they, they were, uh, usage has increased exponentially. Uh, do you, uh, two questions to you. Number one, about uh, innovations in Sri Lanka. And number two, which I'll come to later and talk to. Uh, uh, Mina also, how women in media have been impacted by this? So. Uh, on the innovation front, of course, again, in Sri Lanka, social media has been very active. I think Twitter is on a different level entirely because uh, a lot of the information is uh, communicated, news is broken all on Twitter. And I think a lot of journalists have taken the extra step to sort of um, be very active on social media platforms and have, I mean, there is a little bit of an ethical concern there, I think, because again, you know, fact check, verification, etc., cetera, is, is, is always a challenge. And of course, you know, when you are uh, on social media platforms as an individual, uh, there is a tendency to judge the information that you disseminate based on personal prejudice as opposed to, you know, being in a, a media. I was actually pleasantly surprised that even though I think that the government can do more to be transparent, they have made strides in trying to disseminate information. For example, uh, we have the health ministry launch uh, platform, data platforms where, you know, uh, patient numbers, number of people who are hospitalized, to people um, who have, uh, you know, the number of active cases, total cases, etc. You know, it's almost instantaneously uploaded and available to everyone. So even if there is a concern of misinformation, there are platforms where the public can go independently and verify information. I think that's very proactive and definitely a positive thing that I hope will expand and continue. Um, from the perspective of uh, the use of public funds, uh, the president has started up his own COVID fund and and they keep uh, updating every single day. We get uh, the notices of so many millions uh, donated, etc. And I hope that they continue that. And you know, even the spending of that will be uh, made transparent uh, because uh, I think that's really critical, right, in, in this time. In terms of, so I think that that is where we need to go. Right, and we need to continue doing that because moving forward with more personal constraints, as my Indian colleague was saying, mental stresses, etc. I think that we really, really have to think differently, innovate constantly, be on the ball while at the same time, so uh, and giving each other. I think it's really important at this point for people who are in the same workplace, for media professionals to reach across. Like in Sri Lanka, we're very segmented. Like newspaper people are alone to themselves. TV people operate separately. Radio operates separately. Uh, you know, we don't really come together. We don't really support each other. We don't really, um, you know, probably uh, and continue on other people's stories. And I think we need to do that. I think we need better collaboration and compassion for each other as much as uh, there is compassion for, for the stories of the people that we're reporting about. Um, on women, well, that's an interesting question. Uh, I think it has been, 
I, I always hesitate when I'm asked to uh, respond to questions as a woman because I, I come from uh, one perspective and I don't know whether this is the universal perspective. But I would, I would say that for women, it has been a, a generally um, unchanged time. I, I think that, um, you know, in, in, across media, we, we will see, and this is another concern moving forward about the challenges because we have these legacy issues as we know about, you know, in, in rough places where women are not always treated equally, where they're not given the same set of opportunities, etc. I hope that this situation means that uh, editors and, and other people of authority become more aware about how capable women are and give them the opportunities that they deserve and have earned. Um, and I think that will be a defining moment. I think we need to have leadership and I think we need to have new leaders and I would personally be very enthusiastic about those leaders being yeah, men. I mean, uh, and so that would yeah, be my, I asked the question because, not that I asked the question because uh, there have been concerns globally about uh, women and uh, their mistreatment and which is uh, we have happening everywhere and it has been reported and yeah. and uh, uh, research is done on that uh when Aurora, you you also wanted to pitch in here on that issue oh, that yeah no i i completely agree with Uvita regarding collaborations and uh, which is what i was uh, also texting in the chat i think uh I, I don't think this pandemic is going to be over when the lockdown is over. I think we are, uh, we will have to think in terms of a, of a different operating mechanism. And if we are to hold ourselves to the highest values of, uh, you know, ensuring that people's right to accurate information is upheld. And like you rightly opened this conversation with that governments don't become bigger and are held accountable. I think collaboration will be the only way out, whether it is collaborating across media uh, channels or it is collaborating with people who are working with communities. I mean, how do you get access to, how do you fact check your information? If the government is putting out X, you, we have to collaborate across parties who can give you that fact check information from the ground. And it will be important to work across, not just across media channels, but with civil society, with other professional mechanisms, with community media, with uh, community reporters, so that we are able to fulfill the job and the task that we have to do. And I don't think the world will be the same, you know, whether it is about how we raise our resources or how we fund our uh, providing the actual information uh, to the people to who we are accountable to or, or to who we make our government accountable. I mean, you're right. We are increasingly depending on the figures that the government has just passed. You know, like Chinky rightly said, we are, we are also human and we can do only so many stories and we can fact check only so many stories. So uh, it is very important to really collaborate, put on our thinking hats and say, okay, how do we work differently from what we have done in the past as uh, media professionals, as editors as owners of me small media large media whatever uh, you have to switch on your microphone pankaj this crisis is far from over and there's a lot to talk about and the crisis actually starts after uh, the immediate health threat is over because the governments all across south asia and other countries of the world have been concentrating on this particular thing. Now the fight against immunization, the fight against polio, the, the, there's so many uh, health crises we are facing that those are going to start showing after a lag and uh, we cannot go back to that. And in all those fights, I think the role of the media is very important because uh, even if you look at immunization, you look at uh, polio eradication, you look at malaria in Sri Lanka, they were all being controlled by the active help of the media. And I think in the future also, we'll need the governments to understand that, that unless there is a free and uh, uh, media, free of uh, um, uh, fear and favor, as we talk about this, we cannot fight health crisis or health problems. Thank you all of you very much. And uh, I thank again UNESCO for giving us this uh, opportunity. I'm uh, sure that Eric has found many uh, uh, individual uh, cases and case studies 
um, which have been put out by all the participants. And I'm very happy also to see that uh, the majority of our, on our panel are women. Uh, back to you, Isaikal. And thank you again. Yes. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Pachori. Thank you very much, uh, uh, our panelists. Uh, thank you for this very active and very, very uh, insightful uh, discussion. Um, there's a request to have the speakers, uh, of course, our host and uh, Mr. Fault, and our partners switch on their videos, and our colleagues from the New Delhi office will leave and we'll have a screenshot. Please, just for a moment, as I wrap up, um, if you can kindly uh, spare us that moment. Um, so, welcome, uh, 